in those early years, you know, when friends of mine were like, oh, I have an idea for a uh, gastro pub. And I was like, let's do it. Let's do it right now. I will, let's find a landlord. Let's raise the money. Let's, let's get going, you know? And that is just sort of like who I, I always am. I mean, a lot of friends will say, don't tell Emmett about any idea you have because he'll force you to do it. Welcome to the creators here at Some City. Coming to you every Tuesday and Friday. Extended conversations that build community making for creators videos, by creators. Art, making what you make. Emmett Soldati is an entrepreneur who has found a home in his former home, returning to the small city of Summersworth after education and experience away. After a number of businesses, the one that grows today is the Teetotaler, a tea and coffee house that is much more. So we invite you to subscribe and give us a thumbs up. Well, you got to watch the show first. So let's get on with the show. Welcome to the creators of Some City. Bill Rogers here with Emmett Soldati. Emmett, thanks for coming in today. Hi, Bill. Great good. to be here. That's, it's good Sorry to see you. Sorry I was late. <laughs> That's quite all right. So we'll start this as we always do. Uh, do you consider yourself a creator, and does that term, a creator, sort of term of art in terms of, um, for example, YouTube creators, but we're using it much more broadly to uh, artists, yeah. does, that, does that have any significance to you? Uh, I think it has significance to me, I, I don't know if it's the word I choose, I definitely think of myself as an expressor, uh, I, I, but maybe creator is part of that, like I do... A lot of people know me as someone that has this cafe uh, that is a quote unquote small business owner and that works in food service. But for me, I see the work that I do as, um, as an, a self-expression, like an outlet for self-expression. And it may be a weird canvas uh, to use like a restaurant as that. So. I think creator is a much closer concept to what I'm doing every day, whether it's creating a menu or merchandise or a Instagram post. I'm I am I'm building it. I'm putting pieces together. I'm, I'm drawing things together uh, thoughtfully and intentionally. Um, so yeah, I think creator is is much closer to what I am than just a restaurateur or a yeah. small business owner. Well, along those lines, is um, is being an entrepreneur is that part of this creator palette? Uh, yeah, no, yes. I, you know, maybe it's one of those concentric circles things. Like, is a is a circle? No, is a <laughs> is a is a square a rectangle? Uh, but but a rectangle is not a square. Um, I think that entrepreneurship and entrepreneurs uh, are one type of creator, uh, for sure. But creator is a much sort of broader concept. You know, and I'm, I'm a big, this may be like semantic and in the weeds, but like I like to define things with like capital letters and lowercase letters. Like people talk about a capital E entrepreneur and it's like that's like a school of thought. That's people that have usually technology focused companies uh they like lean and agile and they uh, you know read certain magazines but then there you can be like a lowercase e entrepreneur and it's like people that just sort of have a sort of upstart let's make lemonade with our situation and produce value kind of approach so i think with a creator uh i mean i guess capital c creator is like the divine creator <laughs> um, or whichever, uh, whoever that may be. But like a lowercase c creator is, you know, people that bring to bear goods and are like, I see something in this with my value and my input that is uh, nuanced and interesting and valuable if I bring it all together. Mm -hmm. So um, in the intro, we mentioned uh, the, the teetotaler. Which is there? <laughs> let's yeah, there you my go. camera. There you are. Product placement. There you are. Um, but before the teetotaler was Levin, and um, before that were some movers and, and shakers. Uh, there, there are a number of things. Oh, man, you're looking at my Wikipedia page. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I should be so lucky. Um, yeah. Well, actually, so t interestingly enough, and a lot of people think that there's this sort of. Uh, it, with my yeah, like I did this and then I did that and then I did that. Uh, eight years ago, seven years ago, I opened this 
little weird tea house called Teetotaler in this dinky little storefront on the back roads of Summersworth. And nobody knew about it. Not a, not a lot of people know about it. So when people see Teetotaler now, which which just like, you know, the new version opened up three years ago, they think, oh, that was Emmett's vision culminating years after having this uh, restaurant and this bread bakery and having an entrepreneur's summit and all of this kind of stuff. And it actually was the initial project that got me to Summersworth. I, o- I opened this tiny little tea house, tea cafe that has largely been forgotten by history. And that's a good thing. It was, it was, it was a work in progress. It was an incubator. Across from Clara. Is that yes, what uh, yes. So the old GE factory. Um, seven years ago, I found a super cheap storefront on a strip of abandoned storefronts. There was tumbleweed blowing in the wind, and I was like, "This is a good idea." So I opened this this cafe. And again, even then, you know, a lot of people look and say, "Oh, well, you're a you're a restaurateur. You're a food person. You must love. You must have always wanted it." A month before opening Teetotaler, I thought I was going to be, I don't know, doing something else. Uh, getting into investment banking, who knows. <laughs> um, and it was it was more that I wanted a space to express myself. Mm. I, I liked certain things in terms of food. I liked certain teas. Uh, and I had a certain palette and style. And I wanted a canvas. Mm-hmm. And... For whatever reason, I thought my canvas would be opening up a business, mm-hmm. a, a brick and mortar storefront, licensed, permitted, you know, you name it. For me, that was my, I was the auteur of a cafe. Um, and that's what I did. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I wasn't expecting it. I, you know, people ask me like, oh, like you, you must have known. I was like, I was a very stupid person. I was very <laughs> So there's no business plan for teetotaler. Uh, you know, it's funny. I found teetotaler's original business plan and I should have burned it. Um, like I found it a couple days ago and it was like, "Oh, you are so cute." Um, it's like, "Oh, I'll oh, I'll open up day 1 and 200 people will walk in the door and I'll make See the, the brilliance ex- of it." Yeah, it's like if you build it, they will come. And I was like, "Wow. It's impressive how naive someone that spent as much money on my education <laughs> as I did can be. Um, so yeah, I did not have um, a clue as to what I was doing. But, and, and this comes back maybe to that entrepreneur, creator type thing. At every juncture, I was like, well, cool. I'm going to go paint this wall. I'm going to go design this kitchen. I'm going to go make that scone or croissant or queen of on. Um, and I'm going to go write that press release. I'm going to go build that website. In each stage, nobody gave me a roadmap. So I was just kind of enjoying it. It wasn't really until I looked at my bank account that I had like this anxiety attack around like, oh, I can't just do this frivolously. I can't just do this with complete reckless abandon. I have to, oh, maybe I have to sell coffee. (laughs) You know, it's like, Mm -hmm. oh, maybe you can't just do everything you want to do because then the lights are going to shut off and the, you know, the, the heater is going to stop working and you're not going to be able to, to buy the, the goods. So all of that kind of channeled me, filtered me into being a little bit smarter as um, a, a business owner. Mm-hmm. In, interesting that you said one of the uh, advantages to a, a place like Summersworth is that we can just, uh, you know, more easily open up a, a place with that, uh, with, with, with less, certain, you know, very directly less overhead. Mm-hmm. Um, and it reminds me of the other kind of creator is a, a YouTube creator, or a video creator. And, and the beauty of doing that these days is you can really test out your audience very quickly mm-hmm. and just see if you're getting response and how you might change it, modify it, uh, yeah. because your, your overhead can be extremely low to do that. Yeah, I think in terms of digital, you know, online, offline, 
there are barriers to entry uh, in any endeavor. I mean, even if you're a you know a content creator, if you are doing a podcast versus doing video, it's like well, you need the camera, you need the editing equipment, blah blah blah. So, in an offline setting, brick and mortar, obviously the stakes are higher. You have you have code enforcement, you have food sanitation, you have taxes, um, all of that to consider. It is amazing how low the barrier to entry was in Summersworth. And in a lot of ways, I didn't know how good I had it. Now, you know, the same can be said for I don't know how bad I had it in terms of revenue, <laughs> you know, and foot traffic mm -hmm. in the early days. But I didn't know how good I had it in terms of how easy because now having opened a couple restaurants, having worked in the industry for some time, meeting with other people that are like, you know, trying to get prime real estate in a busy tourist area, like in a place like Portsmouth, um, they, you know, the, the city and the, the organizations surrounding the infrastructure to support that are, are making, try to make it very challenging and make it very difficult because they need to make sure you pass through so many hoops. And in Summersworth, you know, I had the code enforcement officer and the mayor and the economic planner being like, what can we do to make you open? How can we help? Um, you know, like the, the, it wasn't like I wasn't up to code, but like, you know, when the, when the fire marshal or whomever came in, they were like, here's what's wrong. Uh, here's the cheapest way that you can solve this, that we in, in good faith can like sign off on it. I know that I, there are other situations where f people would come in and be like, that's out of code. You know, I'll see you in a couple months. Good luck. Um, the barrier to entry was so low. And that's really why I did it. I think if I were smarter, I think if I had had uh, a degree in accounting <laughs> or any sense of accounting, um, I never would have done it. I, I would have I would have run a pro forma. I would have looked at my numbers. I would have... in asked a couple folks about how many people actually patron downtown. And I'd be like, I could never make it. I can't make it. There's, there's no money here. Um, I, you know, I'll run out too quickly. And I didn't know enough to ask the questions that would have prevented me from doing it. And that in itself is a barrier to entry. Um, and because a lot of times if you're a creator, you know, like you're someone that makes lemonade, you, you, you're a problem solver. You no no matter what no matter how good the origin is and the the, the startup is, you're going to run into problems and you're going to run into challenges and you're going to have to make tough decisions early on. I'm just glad I didn't somehow you know get a hundred thousand dollar loan to do it to realize I couldn't make it. Um, I mean, I guess I got a big loan to go to school, <laughs> you know. So I. I um, I understood that a little bit, but um, Summersworth was a playground, especially where I was in Summersworth. I mean, it was a, you know, it was a little Dust Bowl street, uh, very cheap rent. I, you know, I, I basically could get in there and get going pretty mm -hmm. soon as long as I knew how to paint and, you know, put up a, a wall or some drywall, um, which I didn't know how to do at the time. And I could go. And, and there was a lower risk so that even if I totally floundered, even if nobody walked in the door after I had spent all that time sourcing and buying and pricing and whatnot, I didn't lose my, sh I wouldn't have lost my shirt um, in it. So that is the reason I was able to start creating. In, in the same way to extend this, uh, you know, uh, metaphor or analogy, you know, a lot of artists tend to go to spaces where the rent is cheap and the studio space is cheap, and that's it. You know, like, that's where a lot of artistic practitioners end up because they're not looking for expensive studios with the perfect lighting and the, you know, perfect whatever else they need. It's like, I need space, and I need it to be cheap. Mm -hmm. um, Teetotaler was cheap space, mm -hmm. and that's why it happened. So why then, um, why then school? Uh, so you've got this great laboratory or, or place. Uh, why then? And, and, and that was uh, that was in in London. Is that right? Am I? Yes, <laughs> I uh, go out and got my 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 master's degree in London. <laughs> I'm I'm saying it in my ASMR voice so that some people yes. won't hear it. <laughs> we, we hear you. I'm ashamed. No, um, I, I you know I am I am a. a 
I am of a firm. My philosophy is. So you're saying that the money to uh, <laughs> to the school don't was... rub it in, Bill. Okay, <laughs> I got a long way to go on those student loans. Listen, I am of the, my philosophy is you are the stupidest you will ever be at this point in time, mm-hmm. with the Great. exception of dementia. Um, but like <laughs> every day you're learning, every day you're growing, every day you're amassing knowledge. Amen. So, twenty one year old just freshly graduated from college, you know, in, in, and having done well in college mm-hmm. and being told, you're great, you're destined for greatness and you're so smart. It's like, well, uh, okay, uh, where do I go? And they're like, well, go to the best school you can and ask Sally Mae for a loan. And I was like, okay, I don't know how interest works. I don't know how, um, you know, any of it. I don't know how FAFSA works. I don't know how I did so well in school not knowing any of these things. I'm, I'm trying, I, you know, I was not very smart. That's the moral of this interview. Um, and so I just did it. I was like, I, I went to a, a good school and it was expensive. And I mean, I have no regrets. I, I had an amazing education and amazing, amazing experience. The school I went to, uh, the London School of Economics, is the most international school in the world, and I think for someone that is uh, a proud New Hampshire townie, like, you know, small town white boy from the whitest state, you know, one of the whitest states, uh, being exposed to how the rest of the world is and works, uh, even if it's in a a cosmopolitan place like London, was invaluable and really eye-opening to me. And not that I would put a price tag on it, but it, it, was, it was worth it. Mm-hmm. Um, did, did Levin come after, uh, come after that experience? And, and was there a uh, larger scale value-driven business plan for Levin? Yeah, I had spent and, some... And Levin, by the way, is a uh, restaurant uh, um, and wholesale retail uh, bakery? Yeah, so the, the full name of Levin... Um, because I like long, clunky names for my businesses that are hard to articulate. Um, Levin, it was Levin Beer and Bread House. Mm, mm-hmm. Rolls off the tongue. Yep, yeah, it rises up. Yeah. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> I thought I killed all my dough puns. <laughs> um, so I had owned Teetotaler for a couple years, and I was you know, feeling good, sitting pretty, making scones, paying my rent, uh, which was very cheap. Um, and I was kind of getting it. I, I realized along the same vein that I started Teetotaler to like create and express and have a canvas for myself. I began to see that that had, to use a politically charged word, gentrifying effects on the city. I began to see that Teetotaler was more than just the intera- one-on-one interactions I would have with a customer and the th- three bucks for the coffee they'd give me, it was starting to, to change the narrative in the way that folks talked about Summersworth and the things that you could do in Summersworth. Even for people that never went to that cafe, uh, heard, oh, there's this funky, somewhat European-style, colorful, queer little place in Summersworth, and it's not, you know, it's not what you think. It's not, it's not what... Um, the sort of sleepy, kind of quiet, working-class mill town conveyed. So I began to see, like, oh, wow, there, there's more here, and, and if only I can drive more people here. And I can't do it alone. I need, I need there to be other businesses. Um, and, and, and friends of mine wanted to own, open, like, a brewery, bar, place. And, uh, you know, the irony being Teetotaler, name of my company, is for someone that doesn't drink alcohol. I named it after me being a teetotaler. So I, you know, I've been sober now for eight years and, but you know, at a certain point I was like, yes, like this is something that I think is another gentrifying force, having a brewery or having um, a gastropub or, or, or what have you. And I had learned enough in that, those early days of teetotaler, you know, when you, when you wake up and you're like, I have $60 in my bank account and I have to pay my utilities and I have to buy the food and et cetera, et cetera, you get quick. You, I mean, you learn quick on how to write a press release and, uh, you know, get customers and run specials and whatever you have to do to get customers. Like you are in a high intensity learning experience. Um, and so all of that knowledge that I had gained of how to run a food service establishment as a 
22 year old, 23 year old, uh, in those early years, you know, when friends of mine were like, oh, I have an idea for a uh, gastro pub. And I was like, let's do it. Let's do it right now. I will, let's find a landlord. Let's raise the money. Let's let's get going, you know? And that is just sort of like who I, I always am. I mean, a lot of friends will say, don't tell Emmett about any idea you have because he'll force you to do it. Uh, and there's a little bit of truth to that. I'm like, I'm an eternal optimist. And it's not just I'm an eternal optimist. I'm someone that I think um, thinks things can happen, thinks new things can happen. Mm -hmm. And I am, I am always tempted to see the path forward and not the, you know, the impediments and the barriers. And so for me, when people are like, oh, we could open this gastro pub or, or, oh, and you know, 10 years from now, I see myself owning a bar. It's like, what's stopping you? There's capital out there. There's space here. There's customers that are beer drinkers here. You know, all these things. So when these friends had approached me, I was like, this can happen. Let's do it. Um, long story short, um, I was secretly, quietly, not just owning this cafe. I was like, like secretly a big sourdough bread baker enthusiast. And I would always tell my friends like, you know, my 10 year project, I was like, I'm gonna open a sourdough bread bakery. And then so while I was telling my friends like, you can do it right now, all this stuff, blah, blah, blah. I was like, wait a second, maybe I can do it right now. So I was like, this could be a sourdough bread bakery. I could bake sourdough bread here. And it just sort of happened that the plans for it to be a brewery dissolved, fell through. And to me, like I knew no matter what, as we were starting this project, there had to be something unique about this business. It, you know, Summers with is a tough market, is, has been a tough market for decades. You can't just be a bar, a restaurant, a diner, although I'd love a diner. Um, you need to be something that will gain you know, get attention and, and, and gain people's interest. And, and they'll drive here from, from the Berwicks or from Portsmouth or from Farmington or from Concord, you know. And so I was like, guys, if, if you're not a brewery, if we're not creating something unique and special, we need something else. And then that's like when the light went off. I was like, bread, <laughs> another carb, another grain. Um, so Levin ultimately became Levin Beer and Bread House. I was the initial baker for Levin. Um, uh, another philosophy of mine, you're going you're to learn a lot of my philosophies. First philosophy, you're as stupid as you'll ever be. Um, Who's that? Or, or you're as stupid now as you'll ever be. Okay, good. I like it. Um, you are the stupidest today that you will ever be for the rest of your life. I need to refine my philosophy. So that's what <laughs> Number two is like, and this is not my own. I didn't invent this, but fake it till you make it. Like this idea of like, mm -hmm. again, kind of being that eternal optimist, seeing the possibility like, Put out there that you can do it. So I told all these people that I was a sourdough bread baker. I was like, oh, my Got dad it. baked bread. My dad never once baked sourdough <laughs> bread. He was a great bread baker, but it was always the same loaf of bread every time. And, you know, when you picture sourdough, I had just come from Europe, and it's like all of these different styles of baguettes and pen a vein and, uh, you know, different large boules and, and, and batards and all these things. And you're like, oh... Well, you know, my dad baked bread once, so I can do this too. And I very quickly found out that I could not. And so I spent a year baking, 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 like every day baking bread in my house. I threw out so much bread, um, ate a lot of bread, threw out more bread. And it really wasn't until like we were getting ready to open, like we were like three weeks from opening. And my business partners who were really... I was the bread guy. They were like everything else. And so they're getting this restaurant ready and they're getting the, the, the beers and, and all that stuff. And they're like, wow, we're looking forward to your delicious sourdough bread that we can use for like our Reuben sandwiches and, and you know, bread bowls with soup and all this stuff. And I was like, yeah, it's coming. It's coming. So would you call up dad? Hey, dad, yeah, did you like, finish that research? <laughs> yeah. I was like, can we? <laughs> I like called in, called in a favor. Like, could you freeze 80 loaves of bread? Um, and I literally, like a month before we opened, went to a conference up in Skowhegan, Maine called the Kneading Conference. So it's like, you're talking bread nerds, people really into bread. And I was like, oh, cool, like I'll go. And I did a work study because I didn't have any money. So I was like, I helped sweep the floors and I was the janitor and then I could go for free. 
But what happened is when you're the janitor, you're the one like behind the scenes. So I was with these like very successful, very world renowned, famous bread bakers, like from San Francisco, from Montreal, from Paris, like the top names. At the time, I didn't know who any of them were, but they're like, hey, you know, I need you to go transfer, you know, this giant, you know, 20 pound um, dough, cut it, shape it and throw it, you know, in the tandoori oven because we're making non bread. I'm like, okay, you know, I need you to go shape 50 baguettes here. And I was like, okay. Um, And so literally in three days. I became a bread baker. It was it was like transformational. I I I could I could bake with my eyes closed. I understood how sourdough worked, um, and it was like then we opened. <laughs> and I was like, and so I was in the kitchen. I was baking. I was baking. I was baking um, all the time. Ultimately, we hired a bread baker who <laughs> was were way better than me. Um, you know, I've since become a good. I've become a, you know, I've become a pretty good um, sourdough bread baker, uh, if I do say so. But, you know, I spent like a year and a half learning how to bake. And then like two weeks in, I was like, let's just hire someone. <laughs> so um, that was the story of Levin. Um, and that's, uh, yeah, that's what we created. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you were talking about uh, your, your, your mindset to take these things on. And, and I actually I heard... Uh, what is your take on this idea of disruption, economic disruption? And that's kind of the uh, kind of the uh, Silicon Valley uh, favorite yeah. yarn these days. Well, you know, I, I did read Schumpeter in, in grad school, so I learned all about creative disruption. Um, no, but that was an intellectual exercise. Um, it's funny you, you mentioned that because I actually um, – I've dabbled in the Silicon Valley world um, it, in between some of these fun little brick and mortar restaurants. Um, I, I did some consulting for some startup companies, like tech startup companies, um, really just t- to make money while I was kind of trying to float opening a new business. And so I got involved with a couple of these companies and, and they're all like disruption and like we're, we're going to ch- Bitcoin's going to change the world. And then someone's like, no, this other coin is. And it's like, okay. Um, and then, so I ended up actually working for a company that it was a technology software company. We built, we built risk related software and it sold to insurance companies. It sold to, to big agricultural companies, insurance companies, uh, to help them assess risk and so forth. And our tagline, or, or sort of the way we would sell ourselves, is that, and this was you know three years ago, so it's still contemporary, is that we are not a disrupting technology. We are an enabling technology. Mm-hmm. Because there is a big fear in a lot of you know, big corporations who are you know, purchasing these, these subscriptions to use software that you're going to just clear the deck. I mean, they, they have all this real estate where they have all these people working and the human beings that are doing their jobs that, oh, you just want me to, like, fire all of them? Um, and, and disruption does not convey a sense of accomplishment. Mm-hmm. It conveys a sense of, of chaos and, you know, this sort of, like, cross your fingers, hope it works out all right. Like, you know, maybe... If you maybe if you take something that's kind of not working well and break it to pieces and throw it down, it'll look like it works a little bit better. Um, so, I think what what I did learn is there's a lot of people with virtually no experience in how the world works, or businesses work, or large entities work, or small entities work that have a great idea, and disruption uh, normalizes their ability to sell it mm-hmm. because it says. You actually don't know anything about the industry you're selling into, and you don't have the time, the bandwidth, or the interest in learning how the industry really works. So you're going to brand disruption. You're going to brand it as disruptive, and that's now become an exciting concept, and you're now legitimized. Oh, so it must be, oh, we're not being disruptive enough. We need to be more disruptive. Now, I, I say all that. I think there's so many problems with the way corporations, government operates and functions off of legacy systems and they don't have enough exercises to, to 
modernized upgrade to update, um, even if it's even if it's cost effective, even if it makes sense for their bottom line. So I think the threat of disruption is sometimes valuable because it gets people to sharpen their pencils and say, oh, well, you know, we need to, to migrate to the web and uh, to the cloud or whatever the case may be. So, yeah, I, I think disruption as a buzzword is a little obnoxious. And there's just a lot of folks that I've met personally. And that's coming back to that capital E entrepreneur, that lean, agile, you know, Y combinator kind of thing where they know so little about their customer you know they're the the person the user that they're actually trying trying to attract um and i think part of it too is as much as we talk about disruption we always many people always stick with the 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 former you know i think um we leave people behind a little bit uh in this idea of disruption so it's like if you don't have air buds in your f- ears and i don't even know if they're called earbuds like you're forgotten about it's like actually no a lot of people have androids and bluetooth or or you know plugged in you know you know it's just Mm -hmm. like that that works well so i don't know i'm like not interested in in disruption for the for the sake of disruption right um i think you get a a medal if you've found an industry that you can disrupt you get Mm -hmm. a you get a cookie for it and I, I've met a lot of people, especially in the insurance world, that are like, I want to go to a really unsexy industry and disrupt it. And it's like, I don't. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I want to go into something I'm passionate about and help it and grow it. And, and, mm-hmm. and you know, so I don't know. I feel like I just ranted about how dumb <laughs> disruption is. And I, maybe I don't care that much. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of, you know, building community. Uh, that's what I see going over because we're right next door to you, and that's what I see happening uh, next door. And it, it seems to me that 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 uh, bringing people in, um, bringing people together to uh, just you know get a cup of coffee, some tea, uh, but also so many of the other events that you seem to be doing there that are bringing people in to make this of uh, uh, to make you know your store in particular vibrant mm-hmm. but it seems to be a part of a a, a a bigger a bigger picture is yeah. that true yeah i mean and this comes back to me kind of not actually having a good knack for being an entrepreneur a business owner i just want to wake up every day and throw a party mm. and i want to throw the party on my mm. terms i want it to be you know teetotaler exists because i wanted something kind of ish like teetotaler to exist and it didn't exist so i made it now again like i i come back to that idea of like but i have bills to pay i have to you know Mm -hmm. um being revenue neutral or you know cash positive is a litmus test of success it's not the only litmus test um growth is a litmus test so i i do feel like i'm not you know a complete idiot anymore in terms of like oh if we do all you can eat waffles, we'll have a lot of business that day. But at the end of the day, you know, I, I'm doing it because, it, yeah, I, wa- I want to just like celebrate lots of, you know, I want to have fun. I want other people to have fun. I want to, um, c- yeah, create different kinds of events and programming and activity that mm-hmm. uh, doesn't exist in new hampshire Mm -hmm. um or in some cases doesn't exist period Mm -hmm. um you know like we are the largest teen drag show teen drag venue in america it's like wow that's crazy but it's also like wow i didn't know teen drag existed i didn't know that was a thing i didn't know it was a thing per se um and that's just something where we started working with some performers who were teen, you know, 17 year old, uh, boys, uh, at least the first uh, couple, um, of performers dressing in drag. And it was wild. It was fun. It was funny. It was so unlike anything I'd seen before. And I'm talking about having seen drag performances in, in London and Toronto and New York and elsewhere. It was just so, connected to youth culture and meme culture and pop music and pop culture with with still the same references to vogue balls and 
you know, major drag uh, personas of like the 80s and 90s. And I was like, this is phenomenal. And we had like 60 people there. It was like, mm. you know, and our space is not huge. It was like, that was a critical mass of people being like, we are cheering on these 17 year olds and wigs and heels and highlight and wit, you know, lipstick and, you know, and it was, so to me, I was never like, I want to build a teen drag venue. It was like, I saw this and I was like, this is an amazing, funny, interesting, exciting thing. I want to put a spotlight on it. I want to perfect it. I want to improve it. I want to help cultivate their talents. And so then we started building that and suddenly, apparently there's like 10 teen drag queens in a 10, 20 mile radius of Summersworth, who knew? Um, and, and, just, and just grow it from there. So I think that kind of speaks to this, this idea that, again that I, I just like building and creating and expressing and doing these things. The content of which, you know, there's there's a little bit of interest. I mean, we're you know we're kind of known as an LGBTQ space. That's wonderful. That that's great. We're known as a sober space. That's very important and meaningful to me. But it, it, no one of these things was exactly what I set out to do. Mm -hmm. um, I just like the idea of building an audience uh, for the, this new kind of programming uh, and and program that is teetotaler. Mm. That's wonderful. Well, we'll uh, there's there's a lot more to talk about, and uh, so we'll talk at another time um, because I got to run off. To get out of here. Another thing, got to get out of Dodge. Yeah, but uh, but it's great to great to speak with you, and uh, really uh, really excited to have found this community as well, mm -hmm. and to be next door is is just dynamite. It's just right there. Yeah. Beep, beep, beep. As I always said, what what I'm what I'm looking for is somebody who throws a really good party. Yeah, <laughs> <'Cause> third philosophy. <laughs> throw a good party because um, it's a it's a it's a it's a vital it's a vital skill. It's it's just having fun. So um, and finding a a a channel in which that contributes to your other goals. You know, for mm -hmm. me, um, it's kind of like. Uh, it's sort of like this Pangea effect. Um, you know, there was once Pangea, this amalgamation of all these continents, and they all split over time. And now, if you look at the globe today, every continent looks different and discreet and unique and separate. And to me, it's like, how do you find the the Pangea in all of it, the common bond? And so it's like, oh, I want to be expressive. I want to dabble in business and economics. I want to dabble in uh, design and uh, photography. I want to dabble in event planning. Oh, well, Teetotaler covers all of that. Oh my gosh. Like, wow. Um, I did it. So I, I think that's a va something that keeps me motivated and, and keeps me constantly on, you know, the up and up with Teetotaler is it is this convergence of so many things that I love. Um, and it's and it's community building. It's it's economic development. It's um, it's it's culinary. It's like you know the the great American baking show happens every morning at Teetotaler. Uh, I'm the star. <laughs> no, I have bakers that are the stars. Um, but you know uh, that's the kind of things that I I think as they're 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 kind of bringing together all these things that may look separate. You know, people are like, oh, aren't you a business owner? Or aren't you uh, don't you just, you know, do billboard photo shoots or aren't you a web designer or, you know, it's like, oh, I, I, I'm actually the guy that does them all through Teetotaler. Um, and that's exciting. That is exciting. So we will, uh, we will uh, see you uh, next door uh, soon for all the things that are that are coming down the pike yeah, and totally. uh, next time we'll talk a little bit about um uh, movers and shakers uh -oh. <laughs> and uh and to hear where did you learn about that <laughs> <laughs> there's a little bird little thing called google um oh my google presence oh yeah the oh. twilight movie came out and it obliterated my google presence because there's an emmet in it uh-huh and so like Circa 2000 and, I don't know, 6, 2007, I was the Emmett Soldati of Google. <laughs> um, 
There is an Avandra Soldati, very attractive Italian male model. I'm okay with him being there. Yeah. But then some weird Emmett from the Twilight series, you know, squeezed his way up to the Google search rank, you know, number one placement if you look up Emmett. So, falls life, to the wayside. Life is so I cruel. I got to do something big. <laughs> and you will. So, we'll catch you next time on The Creators of Some City. Uh, thumbs up us. Uh, go over to the teetotaler. Check them out. Your website's really good, too. So uh, you. if you don't live in the area, just check out just what look these at the folks website. are doing. Just absorb the website. <laughs> there you go. It's like drinking a warm cup of oolong tea. <laughs> yes, sir. So catch you next time on The Creators of Some City. Bye. One last time. Bye, MS DSMR. <laughs> EDMR. <laughs> EDMR. Is that, that's eye blinking, right? <laughs> <laughs>